Hello everyone and welcome to a very special uh, episode, a very special review with um, Jams and Tea or should I say Amped and, and today we're going to be doing another special uh, video for a, a special album's birthday, special little guy um, turning 35 this year, uh, Peter Gabriel's So. Um, so we've been doing retrospective videos this year, we've been doing 1991 retrospectives, we've done a couple of videos that have coincided with the birthdays of other albums, um, but we wanted to do a special video to commemorate this record on its 35th anniversary, because this is, regardless of where you fall on it, this is a very important pop record, a very significant album in 80s pop music. And it also pairs nicely with another, another significant album in 80s pop music that we're going to be reviewing later this year, which is Peter, not Peter, Paul Simon's, Paul Simon's Graceland. Graceland. Um, so those, the, this, those, these two videos, I suspect, will be kind of like sister videos. Um, but anyway, Peter Gabriel, So. I think it's fair to say the singer's voice that I heard the most during my entire childhood, or at least until I got into music independently of relying on my dad, was the voice of Peter Gabriel. Um, Peter Gabriel, obviously, as we all know, started out as the idiosyncratic uh, and eccentric front man of one of the great British progressive rock bands, Genesis, and the driving force of a lot of what made them such a distinct and fun band in the late 60s and early 70s and once Peter Gabriel reached the zenith of his creativity with that band with the ambitious 1974 double record The Lamb Lies Down on Broadway he parted ways uh, with the band and began to carve out a solo career as a pop musician but retaining the same kind of idiosyncrasy, idiosyncrasy as he had in Genesis except toned down considerably and more sculpted to the world of pop music. Um, and this transition was a slow one. He, it manifested gradually. Uh, he released a series of four self-titled records in the late 70s and early 80s. Car, Scratch, Melt, and Security. These titles are not official. Um, I think Security is technically an official title, but they are basically nicknames that uh, are based on the album art of those records. And Peter Gabriel didn't like titling albums because he felt that it just having an album title distracted from the sleeve design and also gave people a certain idea about uh, what to expect from the record that he wanted to be communicated exclusively through the art. Um, and so the record title, So, is kind of like uh, a concession to the label that demanded a proper title. It is, uh, it's, it's both a tongue-in-cheek, there you go, there's your title, placeholder, um, that ultimately, whether intended or not, also has a beautiful simplicity to it. It's less an affronted so, and more a measured so, uh, as though Gabriel yeah. is taking a deep breath before revealing his sprawling cinematic creation. Right launching into a diatribe of sorts yeah exactly and it's like a a deep breath before something which has a sonic scope that is so much wider than anything uh gabriel had made before and this isn't to talk down those earlier self-titled records uh, honestly the two that immediately precede this one melt and security are both basically almost as good as this actually i'll go as far as to say that melt is my favorite peter gabriel album and i think his greatest masterpiece uh, it, it presages a lot of the more atmospheric sonic aspects of this record, while also featuring some of his most consistently moving songwriting. But that's obviously an album for another day. What is it that makes so, so special? For one, the, I think the first thing to be talked about, um, and in, in many ways the defining aspect of this record, is the production by um, Daniel Lenoy. Uh, Daniel Lenoy is was one of the most important producers of the 80s in many respects. He studied under Brian Eno, and together Eno and Lenoy uh, worked to produce U2's most important 80s records, giving them a distinct spacious sound that has persevered and was in many ways an antidote to the purposefully cluttered and claustrophobic loudness of a lot of 80s production. 
Lanoi has produced a number of great records over the years. Another that comes to mind is um, Emmylou Harris's Wrecking Ball, for instance. And you have that kind of spaciousness, that kind of beautiful sense of real heft to the sounds that comes from their own in, their own integral, their own intuitive beauty, rather than any kind of wizardry or effects. Um, and there's so many elements across this record of the production that we have Lanoi to think that make this the beautiful listening experience it is. Just, I think about the space in the mix of Red Rain, for instance. I think about the gorgeous warmth of the synths and Don't Give Up. Um, every gorgeous sonic detail here you have Lanoi in collaboration with Gabriel to think. And, and also on the note of production as well, when you think of 80s pop, one thing I particularly want to note about this record is the drum sound. So when you think of 80s pop, you think of this particular kind of gated reverb drum sound that actually originally uh, originated with Peter Gabriel, thanks to a stroke of creative genius from producer Hugh Padgham when he was miking the drums on the song Intruder, which is the opening track on Melt. It was, a, it was this gated reverb sound that then became popularized by Phil Collins, uh, hilariously, um, Peter Gabriel's part, creative partner on In the Air Tonight. Uh, and that his, sound uh, his came... evil version, as some would say. <laughs> that sound came to define the 80s. But what's interesting is that despite the fact that that sound originated with Gabriel, it's basically absent on So. And instead, Lenoy and Gabriel together make the drums sharp, staccato-like, aggressive, but not brutal not like too ugly sounding it's a neat and noticeable counterpoint that i think defines how so stands out from the records that precede it now obviously there's a lot of importance there's some important songs to talk about in this record that we will get to but i wanted to start by opening this discussion up about the sound of this record and what you two think what the two of you i should say think of <laughs> the way this album sounds and how that contributes to uh, the quality of the record. Well, to be quite honest, Tyler, I, I don't give much of a shit what Bono thinks about this album. I'm sure <laughs> he's a fan. Um, yeah, this is an album that, near as I can tell, fundamentally changed the way that pop music is made from this point forward is it's definitely a, as much of a defining record of the 80s as something like Michael Jackson's Thriller or Prince's Purple Rain. Hugely important record, not just for the, the, the ground it broke, but for just on songs like the unforgettable Sledgehammer, just perfecting funk fusion into the mainstream and sort of pop appeal at that point. Mm. There are obviously leagues and leagues of funk songs that crossed over into a mainstream prior to this, but there was definitely a sort of wider acknowledgement of it But now that Sledgehammer came out and was as fucking goaded <laughs> as it was. Mm. I mean, also an important component to Sledgehammer is the in a very eccentric memorable music video it was paired with i was going to get to that yeah yeah and the th this was really around the time that mtv was firing up yeah um and sledgehammer is in no small way a part of what made that what it was at the time and, yeah and a lot of this album i think can be attributed to that because like so many of these songs are have music videos attached to them i mean obviously none quite as creative or technically proficient as sledgehammer but i think they're but those still exist for the mtv audience none, none of them are sort of a see it on the back of your eyelids when you close your eyes <laughs> yeah, yeah that's that's a good and the, the, the thing about Jesus. the the, the importance of the Sledgehammer video really can't be overstated. The year yeah. after its release, the Sledgehammer video uh, went titanic on MTV's mu music video awards. It won nine trophies, which are the most that any single video has ever won. 
uh, of the VMAs. Uh, by some estimates, Sledgehammer is the most played video in the entire history of MTV, depending on who you ask and how you measure it. It is a remarkable success for uh, an artist like Peter Gabriel, who had had hits as a solo artist. I mean, obviously, you absolutely cannot deny the success of songs like Salisbury Hill or Games Without Frontiers, for instance. But Sledgehammer was something else. Um, and what is also so great about Sledgehammer is that it is a fantastic addition to the pantheon of pop songs about penises. Uh, in fact, it might be the greatest of them all. Uh, it is an absolute, and it, it is just ri ridiculously impressive on so many fronts how Peter Gabriel is able to pull this song. Peter Gabriel is able to pull this what, song off. The, the whitest cream. Exactly. He, um, he spoke of the inspiration, I believe, of Otis Redding a lot when writing and recording this and his vocal performance is absolutely full of conviction he absolutely pulls off that funky soulful feel um and just to have such a successful song that is so bluntly sexual as well like you it opens with that line um you could have a steam train if you just lay down your tracks which is one of yeah. my favorite innuendos in all of pop music and it's just one of many on this song. You could have a big dipper going up and down all around the bins. You could have a bumper car bumping. This amusement never ends. Show me around your fruit cage because I will be your honeybee. Open up your my fruit favorite, cage because the fruit is so, sweet as and, and What are you talking about at that point? Like, so, I can't even, something that. What? Something that I think is also crucial to the sledgehammer music video is that it it was not made on the cheap notably it is shot on film proper and a lot of bands did not have the foresight to do that and would shoot their music videos like queen notably mm -hmm. shot uh their video for bohemian rhapsody on uh they shot it on vhs cameras i it has obviously not seen the same life in hd later like sledgehammer has and that's that i think that also ties into that aspect of, of foresight that exists in this album absolutely yeah sledgehammer is, is a great it's just one of the great pop singles ever but i think what is fantastic about this record is that it is sledgehammer is only one kind of piece of the puzzle of peter gabriel's big crossover and i think that this record um i don't think it's a perfect album um but i do think it demonstrates a, in, in a lot of very diverse and beautiful ways what is what peter gabriel's strengths are both as an individual artist but also as a as an artist who chooses his collaborators wisely like lenoy for instance is one just absolutely a match made in heaven for this record um, there's a lot of collaborators across this record both musically and vocally who add a lot to the effect of it and it feels in many ways like a music geek's wet dream in certain respects like when kate bush shows up kate on don't bush when she shows up on don't give up or also for instance when um laurie anderson shows up on excellent birds as well that's a little bit more of an esoteric music geek moment but these kinds of collaborations are the sort of thing you would not expect from Peter Gabriel at this point, but add so much character to um, the record. And there's a real spacious, I've talked about the spaciousness to this record. It's spacious without relying on reverb. There's a very big distinction between space and reverb, obviously, that the two get weirdly conflated a lot of the time. But this is a very smooth sounding spacious record. Um, and I think all of the record's strengths both in terms of its pop accessibility uh, and its beautifully gorgeous soundscapes are encapsulated on Red Rain, which uh, yeah. I, think, I think is one of the, yeah. one of uh, an amazing song. Uh, it just- Maybe the best opening track of the 1980s. <laughs> well, I, some might it, say. It certainly would deserve to be in the conversation. It has this real sense of, of, of scale and grandeur to it. And Peter's voice on this song, uh, I always think of Peter Gabriel as having one of the most distinct voices because 
I grew up in my childhood hearing his voice all the time. My dad would play his records so often, both the Genesis records and the solo records. And his, rec his voice is so recognizable to me and so nostalgic. Yet he sounds so different on obviously both of the first two tracks on this record uh, in different ways. But Red Rain, he has this real sense of, of, of weariness to him. And you're not going to like this comp, um, Morgan, but in, in many senses, not in terms of how it sounds, but just in terms of like the, the feel of it, it does remind me of like what you 2 were going for and Bono was going for on some of his vocal performances on, on songs like, on records like um, Unforgettable Fire and, and particularly the Joshua Tree uh, as well um, at their prime have, have songs that have the same sense of, of, of grandeur and beauty that Red Rain has. But but Red Rain is so distinctive. Yes, yeah, yeah, I think I think that point of inspiration on on U 2s part is pretty ob objectively true, um, and a lot of that is just down to the influence of Brian Eno in many ways, uh, because something like the title track on Unforgettable Fire feels very of a similar part to something mm. like Red Rain. Yeah. Um, but those were released the same year. So, I, I, you know, a lot I think, of it is I think, the... I think Fire is 84, is it not? Yeah, it's, it's, it's 84, but um, I think you're right about the connection between the two. Yeah. Yeah, ultimately, it's just both taking huge influence from Brian Eno and then almost mm. in the aftermath of both of the so and joshua tree just kind of playing off of each other yeah in some ways and, and because of the huge success of those artists those bands that's where the massive influence comes from i mean yeah that i think so and the joshua tree while quite different records uh in many ways are part of a set of albums that epitomize the direction of popular music in the 80s um and and some of its most beautiful stuff some of the most beautiful stuff that would come out of it is on those two records like the pop landscape in the very least i'll say the white pop landscape these very much feel like th the bars that everyone aims to like yeah. the joshua tree and so in mm -hmm. particular are like just really huge spacious gorgeous soundscapes um, they're so holy of their time absolutely and so i think um so can kind of be distinguished between two different kind of types of songs or maybe three i suppose depending on how you think about it but there are these huge moments of like intense grand grandiosity and beauty uh but also like uh immediacy songs like um uh, Sledgehammer and uh, Big Time, for instance. And I think both of these songs capture an aspect of the record that is also something worth discussing, which is just how musically uh, fantastic the performances are and from beyond just um, Peter Gabriel himself. Like, for instance, I want to talk about Wayne Jackson, who plays um, trumpet on Sledgehammer and Big Time. And his horn arrangements on those songs are massive and fantastic. And I also want to draw your attention to maybe my favorite musical contributor on this record, Tony Levin. Yeah, plays... I, I was going to mention him too. It's fine. Um, so Tony Levin plays bass on most of the songs on this record. Um, adds so much uh, weight to the rhythm on those songs. Uh, I particularly love my favorite little moment on this record that he adds is he has a little bass solo at the end of Don't Give Up that just is like a grace note on that song that I, I absolutely adore. Um, but, also, but also the way that he plays on this record is so creative. Um, one of my favorite uh, aspects of his playing on this record appears on Big Time, where you have the, the, the unique smacking sound of the bass on that track is apparently achieved by the drummer Jerry Marotta hitting Tony Levin's bass. Uh, and it gives it this particular um, swagger and sound that I absolutely think gives that song a big kick but also one of the big appeals of this record for me is how beautiful it can frequently be 
I think that um, as I talked, I talked about the warmth of the synths on Don't Give Up. And I, I'm particularly enamored with the just gentle gorgeousness of Mercy Street as well, which is just God. Oh, God. I, I know I was listening to it in the car this morning. I put this album on. I went for a drive this morning. I put this album on and I just found myself weeping during that song for some yeah, reason. It, it's yeah. like, I feel like to some degree, this this is my experience anyway. I've heard this album in full probably upwards of 50 times and it's only on like the, the 25th to 30th time that Mercy Street fully connected for me where I was I was just, you know, the album was going along and then it started and I was just like, oh my God. <laughs> what? Is a, a that, couple this of, was here the whole time. A couple of interesting facts about that track is that it was inspired by uh, Brazilian, native Brazilian music, photo music. Um, and while listening to the song during its recording, um, the tape player in the studio accidentally played it back 10% slower than it was originally recorded. And Gabriel really liked the way this sounded. And so that is the way you hear it. And the final version of the song, it has this real ethereal quality to it. And he harmonizes with himself in this song as well. It's difficult to hear the first couple of times you listen to it, but it's a really low harmonization. Um, it's a whole octave lower than the main vocal line. And he, the only way he could achieve this voice was recording the vocal um, just after he wake, woke up because he just couldn't reach that particular range any other time. But it's a beautiful inclusion. It's a beautiful, subtle detail that adds a lot of weight to his vocal performance on the track. Um, again, his versatility as a singer on this album is really something that should be commended and, and talked about. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I did fairly recently just pick up on the... Uh, obviously, in the chorus, you hear the, the really high... Uh, harmon harmonies in that song that which are fucking breathtaking but the super super low ones it, it makes so much sense to me that he couldn't do that unless he had just woken up because that's like it, it almost sounds like inhumanly low uh, but it is such a fantastic touch to the song and enhances so much of it yeah I mean Mercy Street and In Your Eyes are just these, I think, just the, the pinnacle of that, that very atmospheric, uh, more somber, almost ambient pop sounding songs, I would say. And your yeah, eyes, maybe, maybe just the pinnacle of music. Yeah. Um, In Your Eyes is, is I, we've not talked yeah. about that yet, but uh, if anyone tries to tell you that In Your Eyes isn't one of the best love songs or pop songs or pop songs about love ever written, you can sock them in the fucking face because that yeah, sort of like shit legally, cannot, cannot go unpunished. It is... Um, I mean, it's, it's really good. It's so really why, fucking why beautiful. Like um, and interestingly, on the original release of the record, it wasn't the closing track um, because, of, yeah. because of something to do with the vinyl release, I think. Um, but anyway, Gabriel wanted it to be and the closing just, track. Uh, this is the picture is isn't on the original release as well that's true he added that um he, he did add that it was a song he added but he added it sort of at the last minute um, yeah he's uh, on subsequent releases um, and in the original release of course closing with uh we do what we're told which is the weirdest choice it, yeah, it makes I... no sense yeah again I, I can't blame gabriel for that yeah. considering that he was forced to move in your eyes apparently he agonized over the sequencing of this record um for a long time and i think it's like um yeah in your eyes definitely belongs at the end and i'm glad it's there and i, I treat it as the closer of the record um i should say the way i i personally listened to this album in in preparation for this discussion is i i listened to it uh in in both sequences and i think and i'm very comfortable in saying that the more modern sequence is the far superior version of the album yeah in that i i would even go so far as to say i think the experiences are almost separate 
in in that just having that having that punch at the very end is so much more impactful and and changes how i feel about the album yeah. i wouldn't say completely but it definitely impacts how i how i would rate it at the end of the day and i, I like um even though it might seem counterintuitive for such a, a slow moving track i like mercy street as the opener of the b-side coming after um that voice again as well I, I, I mean, I love the way that this record lulls from these dreamier moments to these more harder hitting moments. Um, and my only uh, issue with the record is that I think that uh, Excellent Birds is perhaps not quite fitting on the album, despite the fact that I love the fact that he put a collaboration with Laurie Anderson on this record where Laurie Anderson is just doing her thing, very classic. Um, it does, and also the fact that the song has a really great um, guitar licks from Niall Rogers on this track, The Legend. Uh, so it's a good song, but I think that um, doubling it with um, We Do What We're Told, which is also a more ethereal uh, interlude type track, does, I think, halt the momentum, I think, of the back half of the record in a way that I think is ill-conceived. I think all you'd have to do is just remove um, Excellent Birds and have um, We Do What We're Told going into In Your Eyes, and I would I would um, think that would be the perfect sequencing for this record. Yeah, yeah, I, see, I, see, I would, I would agree. I would toss. We do what we're told. I would definitely not bad. If nothing on this album is fucking bad. But I, I do prefer. I think it's more. Div I think uh, this is the picture is more developed than we do what we're told. And while it may not exactly serve the purpose that you all are talking about, I would rather have eight full songs yeah not eight full songs and uh more of an interlude type thing that's a reasonable perspective I, I, I think i will say though there there is a song that i i personally don't really care for on here i am i cannot get on board with don't i think i know it. yeah i knew you were gonna say that fuck and, and look I, I don't think it's kate bush's feature that is particularly bad i think she's a good singer you did, you're right no the fuck you do not yeah, no. I, I just find the song corny as hell, and I can't get over it being the cheesiest fucking thing ever. You know, August, I think this is... I, I knew this. I knew you were going to feel that way. I think this is an interesting point of discussion, because there are definitely examples in music where that we've experienced in the past where you do have songs like Don't Give Up that are incredibly sincere in, in a very direct way that I know you don't necessarily always respond to. But I, I think the thing that really sells Don't Give Up for me is I don't, yes, the expression of the song is quite straightforward and simplistic, but I, I think that because of, of the way that, that Kate Bush delivers her vocal performance, the way it counters Peter Gabriel's, it feels so, I don't know, real and earned and genuine that for me, it kind of overcomes any of the, cheesiness that one might associate with that kind of ballad like it, it it just has a real sense of like genuine emotional heft to it like especially the way that she really impassionedly delivers those lines like you still have us and, and stuff like i don't know really i really dig it and also it's the warmth of those synths as well that i really love it is a beautiful song it, i think yeah but i understand why it might not appeal to you and yeah, I, no, I, I would, I would uh, have the crux that I do, I do agree with you about the synths being a really, those, those really warm atmospheric synths being a, a really good part of the song. I think that's, that's the reason I don't hate it. I just dislike it uh, kind of almost for the, I, I mean, I guess I, I hear what you're saying about uh you being able to get on with the the emotions of the song that's just not something that connects with me at all really fair enough um yeah i mean it, it took me a while to get on board with that song because I, I think i did first hear this album when i was about your age uh, and was admittedly a fair bit more cynical than i am now so not I'm not necessarily equating my experience with yours there. I think we, you and I, if we were both 18 right now, we would think very differently about a lot of things. <laughs> um, 
uh, much in the way that we do now, but we find much more common ground now than I think we would at eight. Shit, you knew me at eighteen. Um, whatever. What the hell was no, I? No, but I, about? I get what you're saying, though. Abs- I, I get the, the mm. point. Yeah. Okay, just to um, bring our discussion back to something a bit more anchored. Um, one thing I do want to comment on about this record that I love and I think really brings it together is that each song, um, with the exception of the interlude, well, actually, no, not with the exception of the interlude, each song on this record is about a distinct subject, has a distinct topic, has a distinct lyrical theme, and I think has a distinct depth to it. And, and that is the reason why I think this record is so consistently impressive. Red Rain is, this, is, is less tangible. It's about a, a nightmare that um, Gabriel had, um, but it has a real sense of kind of like uh, emotional lostness to it, like a real a sense of feeling that, that you're at a certain point in your life and you are at the whim of the world in a certain sense and you are trying to figure out who you are and what you're going to be that mirrors a lot of what this record represents in, in Gabriel's career. Then Sledgehammer is just I'll be, ostensibly the sex banger, but like really it's about like, again, it's about connection. It's about, hey, we need to, it's like stop, let's stop fighting and, and, and make up. It's about trying to come together in a relationship uh, and, over, and overcome some kind of, and obviously it's not just, it, you don't just have to read it purely as a sex jam. Like it, it genuinely, I think can be read. It's elliptical enough to be read in a lot of ways about overcoming and then don't give up is, is about being in this particular place and, and having a voice that is there to support you and pull you through. Um, and, and that voice again, actually is like the pop counterpoint to that track where it is, kind of com- similar subject matter but it's like a, a completely different atmosphere and a completely different vibe don't give up as like you're you're reach you're in your absolute lowest and someone else is reaching out to you and that voice again is about you then gaining the strength to stand up yourself and move forward uh, and then uh, you have one of the great um, satirical tracks of the 80s which is big time which is like this whole um, like satirization of the yuppie culture uh, in Reagan era America and and that, that's a really funny song I think uh, I really enjoy the sense of humor that that track has uh, and the funkiness of it yeah it helps that it's just a fucking banger yeah I I, I really dig that song yeah. um, I, I I found myself personally a little leaning more towards as I think I already said more towards a bit of the uh, the more ambient pop type stuff but i i, I did like uh big big money big time I don't know. <laughs> yeah and then of Rich's course you got power windows you got um <laughs> but we do much what, about rush yeah and then of course we got we do what we're told which is um obviously directly alludes to a very famous psychological experiment um a, a, an experiment about obedience obviously as the title suggests um, if anything, the sentiment in this track is, is, is maybe a little too direct. Like It's very direct, obviously, and it's perhaps something that I would have liked to have seen Peter explore and flesh out within a fully-fledged song than just have as this kind of blunt statement. But I appreciate what it for what it is. And then In Your Eyes as this closer is, is just this en- en- endearing beautiful love song rumored to be written about Rosanna Arquette uh, who Peter Gabriel lived with for some time in the 80s and um, seen one after of, hours it makes sense yeah. and one of the beautiful aspects of the song is the incorporation of vocals from um, one of the great Senegalese superstars uh, Yusu Ndur who adds these beautiful um, vocal counterpoints to the last part of this track uh, it's just an amazing song as we've already kind of explored and explained why yeah. to to put it in perspective my feelings on that song that that is my f- fourth favorite song of the 1980s only beat out by at number one everybody wants to rule the world number two running up that hill uh number three joy division's atmosphere yeah um which if i can <laughs> And right below that is Spirit of Radio. Yeah. At so, number five. 
Uh, it's kind of, of these a... are in my top 30 of all time. So, you know, it's fucking yeah. And what's another another aspect of it that's, that's, that's lovely, especially is the closing track, is that the incorporation of those vocals from um, uh, from Yusu Indoor, um, the incorporation of that kind of African influence, is something that will carry over into the record that I see as just such a sister record to this, Paul Simon's Graceland, which incorporates other kinds of of African subcontinent. Uh, influences and musical traditions into pop music and in a lot of interesting ways so it's almost like you can imagine although I imagine that record was probably mostly made by the time this came out you can imagine um, Paul Simon hearing this track and thinking okay I'm going to take that and I'm going to build on it and I'm actually very interested to see how everyone's thoughts on this record and that record relate um, because yeah They'll, that, that'll be not to deviate from this discussion too much, but I think that will be a really interesting conversation. Yeah, I think that's that'll be in August. I have that slated for. Yeah, the anniversary is line it up with the. Uh... Yeah, the anniversary is in August, so um, that will be ideal. But yeah, um, yeah, so so fucking good, more like. Yeah. All right. Well, on that note, um, we must well wrap it up then. Favorite tracks and ratings for Peter Gabriel's So. Um, I'll go first this time for a change. My three favorite tracks on this record are In Your Eyes, Sledgehammer, and Red Rain. Our least favorite track would be um, This Is The Picture. Uh, and this record gets a 9 out of 10 from me. Uh, my three favorites are In Your Eyes, Mercy Street, and Sledgehammer. Uh, least favorite, We Do What We're Told. Uh, fuck it, 10 out of 10. All right. I stuck uh, between a 9.5 and, and a 10, but whatever. So for me, I'd say three favorite tracks are... Uh, in Your Eyes, Mercy Street, and Red Rain. Least favorite is Don't Give Up. Uh, I, I guess I guess I'll do this because for the original track list, I'd give us like a six, but for the new one, I'd give it a seven. So I'll split the difference and say six and a half. All right. Okay. So that gives us an average of fig. Gives us an average of 8.3 uh, for this record. Which we just had an 8.3 in uh, Autekker's uh, Gantz Graph EP, but that also puts it up with Death, Spiritual he Healing, Antlers Burst Apart, Everything, Everything's Man Alive, Run the Jewels, RTJ4, and Microphones in 2020. Baller. Um, so let us know and what you at home think of Peter Gabriel's So. Is it your favorite Peter Gabriel album? If not, what is? What do you think of the legacy of this record? Do you think we missed anything in our conversation about the record? Let us know in the comments below. Right. And I think that, uh, that brings us out pretty well. So mm -hmm. as always, rock over London, rock on Chicago, Geico, so easy, a caveman could do it.